Good evening. It's time to start our Bible class this evening. Appreciate everybody being here. We are continuing along. Um, move that down a little bit. We are continuing in First Timothy, and we are in First Timothy chapter five. First Timothy chapter five. And we're picking up at nineteen and we'll move on to the end of the chapter. Uh, we'll just read it and then we'll come back and make a few points on some of the things that are there. Uh, beginning in verse nineteen, it says, Against an elder received not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses, them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels, and thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. Drink no long, longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment, and some men they follow after. Likewise also the good works of some are manifest beforehand, and they that are otherwise cannot be hid. So this is our text for this evening, and we'll just chisel away down uh, beginning in verse 19. And uh, in verse 19, you have the uh, statement, against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. And um, if you look at this particular text, it is drawing um, from a couple of different places. One that will connect, and then we'll come back to this, but one that we'll look at is in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 1. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 1. Paul says, this is the third time I am coming to you in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So we see Paul using this and actually he's referencing um, the principle that was laid out coming from Deuteronomy. And so what we're going to do is jump back to Deuteronomy chapter 19 and in verse 15. Deuteronomy chapter 19. And in verse 15, it says, One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin in any sin that he sinneth. At the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. And then in verse 16, If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, and then it goes on and lays out the structure and how that is to be handled. But ultimately, um, this is showing how things are uh, validated if there is an accusation, how it would be considered even to be entertained. And so that's what's being referenced here. And so going back in our context, um, you know, we've been talking here in uh, chapter 5, um, it talks about those that are the elder that is, the older person, the presbyteros, or presbyteros in uh, chapter 5 and verse 1, is just someone that is older. Um, but when we come down here, also in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 17, um, you can see when it talks about the elders in 5.17, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. And so you've got elders that are ruling, and so we're talking about the office of those that are qualified and have been appointed to that particular work as shepherds over the flock. And then in verse 19 would make sense, the context would drive that when we're talking about the elder here, um, that we're dealing with that, that leader, the one that is the shepherd of the flock. Granted, the principle that's laid out applies to any. Um, that the validation of some accusation that was being brought because that was the point that was being made in the Old Testament. And that was for anybody, 
not just bringing an accusation against someone that was a leader. But the driving force here is, again, looking at verse 17, elders are the ones that are, uh, the shepherds are ruling over the flock. They're then in front of everybody and then would be people that would be open to criticism probably more frequently than others because of that role. And because of that, then you have the context which says, against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Why? Because that matter needs to be validated, or even before it's entertained, there needs to be witnesses. Um, one of the commentators that uh, I read, and I, I wrote down the quote, he says, never listen to any accusation against a leader unless it is supported by two or three witnesses. And then one accusation can ruin effectiveness and reputation. And so anybody can just come and make an accusation, but if there is no validation of that, no proof, no witnesses, then the matter is not then established and so that is uh, what is the laid out, at least in this particular verse. You know, we, we do know that uh, there are several passages that deal with how we would handle sin. And of course, when you go down to verse 20 as well, it says then that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. Uh, this shows a couple of things. Um, well, one, according to Matthew chapter 18, no one is above rebuke. You know, every single New Testament Christian, it's possible if there is sin, then it is to be handled, even Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, with unfaithfulness, individuals are to be restored. James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, individuals can be brought out of the fire, there is restoration, but every individual, it's possible for there to be a rebuke, and... Um, for the purpose of trying to restore an individual. But in this instance, it shows that even those that are leaders are not above sin and are not above rebuke. Even those that are the shepherds of the flock. And so that's why this is placed here. If that is the case, if it has been validated and it is true, and if that one refuses to repent, um, then you would follow on. Now, when you look at church discipline, especially um, throughout the whole of the Bible, you're looking at a lot of different passages that help to fill in the gaps. And so, when you look at Matthew chapter 18, it gives a little bit of a picture there. It starts where there's one individual that sins against another. That's not where this passage starts. Um, this passage is not starting in that particular thing. You've got an elder that sinned. You've got two or three witnesses. Actually, it skips that process. There isn't a, one person going to one person. And it says don't do that, matter of fact, in this instance. And so in this instance, when you're dealing with an elder, then you're actually going to the next step, which if you look at Matthew 18, we can do that just uh, for a moment. So flip over there with me to Matthew chapter 18, and it helps fill in the gaps of what is being discussed here. And, you know, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1 and 2 also would fit right into uh, this principle because sometimes you have people that just have open public sin. It's not a private sin where one person has faulted another brother and one has to go to them privately. It's just people are aware of the sin. It's public knowledge. And so you're skipping to the next step in which ye which are spiritual restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. So actually, you've gone to the next. So let's go back uh, in Matthew chapter 18 and beginning in verse 15. He says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass or sin against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Thou hast gained thy brother. And so you can see here, this as an instance in which you have one individual that has committed a sin against another individual. And if that's the case, that person has to go to them and make it clear. Uh, uh, this is um, what you've done. You've sinned against me. This is you know, very clear, very specific. Not vague generalities, very specific. Otherwise, a person can't repent of something if you go to them with vague generalities. You have to lay things out very specifically. Tell them exactly what they have done 
so that then they could have an opportunity to understand, to be convicted, to, to hear the rebuke, and then to be able to repent and to make things right. And if, if he hears you, then that's the end. It's taken care of. It doesn't go anywhere else. You've gained that brother. He's been restored. The relationship's been restored. His relationship with God and the relationship with his fellow man. But if he doesn't, if he refuses then, in this particular instance, then we see we're going to a second step, which is here in this passage. In verse 16, he says, But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more. So this, this is exactly what we're seeing over here when we're studying in 1 Timothy chapter 5. It's what we see in many other places. It's actually what we see in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. We see it in other places where they're actually starting here because verse 15 doesn't describe the situation. Um, and so step one uh, is not where they're going to start. They're going to, in essence, start at step two because that's where they are in the process. And so, um, you know, and, and, and so if it, it's not just one brother against one brother, for example, um, then they, it's just public sin. Those that are spiritual, then they go, and that would certainly describe where you take one or two with you. At the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And so that's the connection here. With elders, uh, you're not going to go one-on-one. -on -one. If it's a sin, then according to the verses we're studying, unless I've missed something, then you actually start just like you do in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. And here in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 16, that's actually where the process would start uh, according to 1 Timothy chapter 5, 19 and 20. And the reason is so that then that, that, act, that accusation um, can, or that sin can be established um, so that it is certain, it's validated. And then, in, and then it says in verse 17, and if he shall neglect to hear them, then what? Tell it to the church. Uh, that's the body of the believers. But if he neglect to hear the church, that is, the called out, the congregation of believers that they are a part of, uh, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. In verse 18, Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So that's the context for where two or three are gathered together. It's in the midst of what we would consider church discipline or trying to help correct someone that has done something wrong to try to bring them back into the fold. And so when we're talking about those two or three, that are gathered together and that the Lord is with them, it is that when you go through this uncomfortable process, and it is an uncomfortable process, it's not easy to go and sit down with someone and say, you've sinned and this needs to be corrected, then you need to understand you're not alone and that God is with you in this. That matter of fact, that God has commanded you to do this and that He is with you. When you read the Great Commission and it tells us to go and to... Uh, teach or make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even into the end of the world, of the age. And so what does that mean? It means when we go take the Great Commission and we go and we teach and, and, and disciple and baptize individuals and then continue to teach them that God is with us and that we are not alone when we go out and do that because we go with His authority. He's the one that has told us to go. In the same instance, when you deal with these things here, when this happens, when it comes up and you follow through with this process, then you understand that God is with you. He is the one that has authorized you. He is the one that has sent you. He is the one that's laid out the pattern for this, and then we should follow. And frequently, um, you, you'll hear people talk about pattern, and I know we had a great lesson during our gospel meeting about the pattern and different patterns that are found in the Word of God, the pattern for worship, the pattern for the organization of the church. This is the pattern for dealing with sin, for disciplining those that are unfaithful, those that refuse to sin. This is God's pattern for dealing with what we would say sometimes maybe problems or troubles that are in the church, or especially sin. 
um, unrepented of sin. This is God's pattern for that. And so it is, there's just as much authority for us to practice this as there is for us to have the organization in the first place that is set aside by God or for the worship of the church. And so this gives you a little better picture of what it means with the two or three witnesses. You can see it from the Old Testament. You can see it being used in many different places in the New Testament also as well. And so um, when he talks about the rebuking in this passage, you know, this is not the same word that is used at the beginning of this chapter. At the beginning of this chapter, in chapter 5 and verse 1, he says, rebuke not an elder. Well, but entreat him as a father. That is, do not use harsh rebuke uh, to someone that is older, but rather entreat as a father. And so that is what has been laid out here. That word, though, is not the same. The word rebuke, actually, in the original language. There are different words than is used over here in verse 20. And so in, in verse 20, you have um, expressing strong disapproval uh, for the actions that have taken place, basically for the sinful action that has taken place. In James chapter 5, James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, says, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. And so it is important. This is why you have the process over here in Matthew chapter 18 and 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verses 19 and 20. That's why this is here. Um, so that someone can be uh, brought back, converted, uh, to save a soul from ultimately uh, damnation, from hell, from death, that is the spiritual death, second death, that Revelation talks about. And so when, it's, when we go back over to 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 19, he says, against an elder receive not an accusation. The word accusation, uh, if we write it out, um, from the Greek letter to English letter, and that would be, um, if we do that, it's transliterated, it, we would read it categoria, um, which we would say is a category, category or categorize. And so it is a formal public charge that is being made against the one that has done this. And so, you know, sometimes when you have those that are false teachers, they will say, um, and, and a false teacher is someone that is publicly proclaiming what it is that they're saying or what they're teaching. And uh, maybe they'll, they'll say something that's just completely false, whether it's about salvation or even about Jesus and the nature and character of the Savior. And when they preach that publicly, some, some would say, well, you can't expose or rebuke publicly a false teacher when they do that. They would misuse Matthew 18 and say, Matthew 18, 15, you've got to go to that person privately first. That's not what that passage teaches. Because number one, it, that one brother did not sin against the other brother and trespass against that one brother. This isn't an issue between one person against one person. This person has made a very public sin, and that's why you would start. Um, and, and actually, you see in Titus chapter 1, when it's talking about the qualifications of, and let's look at that together. When it's talking about the qualifications of an elder, um, it talks about them having the ability to stand up against those that would do so and that would divide and teach something that's false. And in the midst of the qualifications of shepherds or elders in Titus chapter 1 and verse 9, he says, "...holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers." For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they, uh, they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped. This is false teaching. They're teaching things that are not, they should not be doing. They're leading people astray into apostasy, to, to um, falling away uh, from the truth. And in the midst of qualifications in the elders, it says this is a part of their role. It's, it's actually giving the qualifications, but it's describing a function of a shepherd a shepherd stands against the wolves. The wolves try to come in in sheep's clothing and they want to, to hurt the sheep. 
And the shepherd is the one that stands against that. He's the protector in that scenario. And that's also what this describes here, as those shepherds are protectors. And they stand against those that would be false teachers. Whose mouths must be stopped, whose avert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. Verse 13, this is a true witness, what he just said about a local prophet that made that statement about those people, their nature, their character. Um, and then he says that, now that's actually true. That What that guy said, that's right. Um, Wherefore, here's the instruction. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. So this is a very strong rebuke. Um, when the shepherd is trying to deal with those, those wolves coming in to harm the innocent sheep, he's not going to deal with them gently. He can't. If he deals with them gently, they'll just rip apart many, many, many sheep. Um, he's going to have to stand against them and that's what it means here where you have that sharp rebuke that has to take place when someone is providing that wrong teaching that would lead others astray. And so, uh, you know, it, there's other passages that would deal with this in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 11. We can turn there just for a moment. It is another illustration of where you have somebody um, that is publicly sinning, and by their example, and what they've done would completely lead many astray. And so in this instance, it isn't the words, it's what the action has been done. And of course, it is by an apostle, which is a leader. And in, in Galatians chapter 2, and verse 11, um, it says, Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. Why? For before that, certain came of James. He did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, that is, the Jews came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And it says he influenced others. Not only did he do that, but there were others that followed his very sinful actions. And so he was publicly and to the face rebuked in front of others, this was not private. In Acts chapter 13, <clears throat> we see the instruction that took place there in, the Jerus um, in Acts chapter 13, prior to the Jerusalem council. Acts chapter 13, verses 9 and 10, Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O full, oh, full of all subtility and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, Wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Now you'll notice who he's talking to when you go back a few verses and those that had been there and what they were doing. And so he stood against them. This is a public um, rebuke. And so we have to kind of differentiate between what's happening. And so you look at the situation and you say, okay, where one, one person has sinned against another, Matthew 18, 15, that person needs to go to that person and say, by the way, you sinned against me. They don't sit and say, I'm waiting for that person to come to me. They may not even know they sinned against you. So you are the one that you feel like you've been sinned against. You go to them. You lay out very clearly what has happened. And if it's, it's, the, it's a legitimate sin and that person repents, then you've gained your brother. Uh, if it's a misunderstanding, it's taken care of in private. And then you're able then to move forward. It's cleared up and it doesn't go any further than that. And so there's an instance, but what happens if uh, that person maybe sins before more than one? Maybe it's just before a few. Then you would want to take care of that. What happens if it's somebody that is a, you know, living in public sin, open in public sin, unrepented of? Then according to Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1 and Matthew chapter 18 and verse 16, then you have a group that goes, and that rightfully so can go to try to restore that individual and to try to deal with that individual. When they refuse that, according to Matthew chapter 18 and verse 16, then it comes before the body, it comes before the congregation. And then the congregation as a whole tries to reach out to that individual. And so, you know, it depends on what it is, what the sin is, and where exactly you begin in that process. But in that case, if that person refused with that, that group that is there, that small group, 
then it, it, it is public knowledge before all. This person is living in this sin, and we want them to repent. And so all of the congregation that begins to go and to try to reach out to that person, that's what it means to tell it to the church. Um, and, and then if they refuse that, you know, the, all, the whole church is trying to get that person to come back, and that person just refuses to come back, then they, in essence, are withdrawn fellowship. And we see the principles of withdrawing of fellowship in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and uh, the instance of that as well, and you can kind of see how that plays out, and in 1 Thessalonians also. Sometimes, you know, people come to this context and it says, um, them that sin rebuke before all um, that others may fear. And so the question is, who's the all? Is it the whole church? Is it the other elder? And uh, most, most would say this is going to be um, the congregation, those that they are, are working with. They are shepherding um, so that they, others may also fear. And so the purpose of the rebuke is for that, that reason. And we see this in Acts chapter 5 and verse 11. In Acts chapter 5, we see sin dealt with there, and then we see the group that witnessed that, they're, they're standing in fear. They have that appropriate fear of that situation. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, in dealing with that particular individual and how it all works out for good. You see the command of discipline in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. You see the blessing of the discipline in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and the restoration of that individual and then the command for the congregation to receive the individual who has repented and to, to continue to move forward and work together. And so that rebuke um, is to be used with respect and fairness. And of course, I think we see that in our context. Even what is taking place in verses 19 and 20 would not go outside of you know, the, the instruction that is found at the first part of the chapter. Um, and respect goes along with all of those things in the process. But it is very important that clarity is used in this process. I mean, can you imagine somebody coming before uh, and saying, we're going to take two or three witnesses and we're going to go talk to this elder and say, now you've sinned. Uh, and that person says, well, how have I done that? But they don't actually specifically give what sin has been committed. It's just something extremely vague. Uh, can you imagine how hard that would be to repent of? Um, I've seen that done where a group didn't like a leader and so they wanted to try to find some way to try to discipline and so all they could say is that person has made mistakes or hasn't done things well. But they couldn't actually pinpoint an actual sin that had been committed and so it made it impossible for the person to say, you know what, I see that I've done that sin and then I can repent of it. If there's nothing that is actually clearly laid out so that a person can repent, boy, you, you've just put them in a bad spot because you said, you know, we think you need to repent, but we can't tell you of what to repent of. Well, how in the world can you reconcile that? You can't. And so that's why it's so significant and so important that when moving through this process that clarity and uh, clear communication is given. Well, I mean, you know, you've got uh, two or three witnesses that have come along and then the charge would be brought before there, you know, and then of course it has to be validated. You know, it, an accusation is just that. And really that's the point. It, an accusation is just that until it is validated. And that's why you have the witnesses that, that then are there to say it is validated or it is unsubstantiated. And then it, <laughs> it doesn't go anywhere. If it's validated and the elder refuses to repent, it goes before the whole church. And so, the, you, know, um, you know, certainly for clarity purposes, it could be written out so that it's very clear. Um, yeah, it definitely would make it, it, it would probably help someone to make it very clear of what they're trying to communicate and for both parties. Um, but, you know, in this instance, and, you know, just as you see in Matthew chapter 18, 
Um, he says, go and tell him. And so you're, you're communicating with words what has been done. And you see that continuing on in Matthew chapter 8, 15, 16 and following where there is that very, very clear communication um, in, in that process. And <clears throat> what, go ahead. So in verse 19, it says, Gets an elder, receive not any ac accusation, but before two or three witnesses. So if you as an individual went and put an accusation there, then it, it appears to me that you would be violating those books. Well, how would you take what verse 19? That's, that's the only conclusion that I can come to because it, it seems right what you're saying, but what I'm saying is verse 19 says you're, if you're dealing with an elder, you skip to verse 16 of Matthew 18. You don't start at verse 15. Because if they sin, but, you know, whether it's an issue or something, but we're, we're talking about, you know, sin. I think the the reason that it's that that and based on things that I've read in various commentaries that they say that should never happen with an elder is because anybody can have that accusation and then they can go to you individually and then they can go and tell anybody anything. And then that's gonna basically split the church because you've brought hearsay against an elder and one person you I can say something, the elder can say something. In this instance, when you're dealing with somebody that is in this position, it appears that he's saying you need to have that validation with the two or three witnesses. Um, but I, I mean, I under I completely understand, you know, where you're, where you're coming from. Well, if it was a sin, then... That that clarification actually makes very good sense. Very good, thank you. So let me repeat that, and it's basically what they were getting at as far as the clarification. That in this, it appears that in verse 19, you have an elder, um, that this sin is not something that is a private sin against one person, but this is something that's not necessarily a personal thing between that one man. They're aware of sin, but it's not necessarily just with them. It doesn't have anything to do directly with them, right? It's just this this sin that has been made known that they're aware of, and now they have to go deal with them, but it, it, it wouldn't 
be something that's very personal. If it's something personal, then that's kind of what Roger was saying. If it's just between me and you, and uh, you've actually sinned directly against me, then you would go back to Matthew 15, I mean, Matthew 18, 15, and go directly to them and reconcile that. And I think that's what Kenny and Roger were referring to, and that's also what you're saying. But in verse 19, then, we would say, this is not just one-on-one, -on -one, you've sinned against me, this is just a sin that we're aware of. It doesn't directly impact me. It's just the same. And then, because of that, then the two or three witnesses. Okay. I think that's a better fit than even some of the others that I've, that I've, some of the others, you know, some other information that I've come through. I think that actually makes even more, it's even clearer. Um, yeah. Any other comments while we're kind of there? really storming out there, I, you know, any, there's no, no, no warnings, right? Okay. Just thunderstorm, okay, all right, we may be singing Send the Light here in a minute, but, you know. Right. And right. And I think probably you know, might have reference to some of the history that's even happened in the past in this just this area. Some of the things that have come up and how some things, especially that are a little broader, have to be addressed because many, many people in the area would be influenced by it. And so that it has to be it has to be addressed publicly. And really, I think that goes back to that Titus verse, Titus chapter 1, where there's, it's, it's influencing many people, whatever it is, and it has to be stopped or it'll just keep on. And that's why it has to be addressed publicly and um, dealt with in that fashion. Going down to verse 21, he says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, the elect angels, that thou observe these things without preferring one or preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. Um, and you know, the charge that's given here is similar, at, the, at least at the beginning of it. 2 Timothy chapter 4, 1 and 2, uh, and especially 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3, um, you can see that as well, a similar charge. But he says, without prejudice, um, without that pre-judging, and really what that would be defined as is an opinion that is formed before facts are known. And so in this particular situation, um, we have to be careful as well. And uh, some examples of how that might happen or how that prejudice might come into play regarding the verses that are all around this. For example, in verse 17, it talks about them receiving, uh, elders receiving double honor. Um, how could then partiality or prejudging fall into that? Well, maybe you don't give honor to someone that is serving as an elder because of their social status or because of their color or because of some preference. Um, you could see that. What about verse 19? Against an elder received not an accusation. Well, how could prejudging or prejudice fall into that? Well, uh, accusation by just one person uh, because the brethren, brethren personally don't like that person and they want to remove him, and so they bring up an accusation to try to move something like that forward, and then it causes that division, and of course that's that prejudging. Verse 20, um, then the, the, them that sin rebuke before all. How could then prejudice affect this verse? Uh, an elder who is guilty of unrepentant sin, but not rebuked, because the brethren like that person. <clears throat> and that's how that preferring one another or partiality could play into the actual context because they favor this particular individual, then they're not going to address that sin. And uh, 
So that you can see how sometimes partiality can play in. And we see that in James chapter 2, 1 through 4, how we are not to have that partiality. Um, David Lipscomb said this in his commentary. He says, when we cover up sins in the church, we corrupt the morality and virtue of the church and destroy its efficacy to honor God and to save men. Evil teachers and evil men must be exposed and purged out of the church, or the church becomes corrupt in a synagogue of Satan instead of the church of Jesus Christ. And so, you know, you can see that also, you know, the principle in, anyway in Titus chapter 3 and verse 10. And so you see a couple of different things you, in this particular verse in verse 21. You see a biased and you see partiality. And so biased from the original Greek, it is pro, which represents beforehand, and krino, which represents to judge. So that's biased is to judge beforehand, prejudgment. But partiality, if you break down the Greek word, is from pros, which is toward something, and then klino, which is to lean. So you're leaning toward something. That means being inclined toward. So you're partial. You're inclined toward this one. You're leaning toward that one and not another. And so that's kind of the idea of those two words that are used in the context here. And so, um, you can see in the context as we remove, or as we continue to go on down in the context here in verse 22, he says, Lay hands suddenly on no man. Verse 22, Neither be partakers of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. And uh, what the laying on of hands is in this context is to being appointed to the work. And so, we're talking about the appointment of a leader, of an elder. And the principle is um, do not get in a hurry to name any man as an elder. And so we have to keep ourselves pure to those who appoint unqualified men or a man sharing the guilt of that sinful appointment. And so that kind of that's the principle that is here being careful about when you go to appoint that. The second bell already ring. Oh, I didn't hear it at all. I'm just rolling. I apologize for that. Thank you guys so much. We'll pick back up there um, next time.